our emails were going back and forth, and we were talking about updates in COPD, trends in COPD, updates in COPD, and then this is how it landed up here. So we'll call it trends in COPD. But I think really it's more appropriate because there's some really exciting stuff I want to talk to you about um, as we move on. So the objectives today, everyone has at least three objectives. I want to talk a little bit about the pathophysiology in COPD in, in the context of the clinical presentation. Some really interesting new stuff uh, coming out, and uh, I want to keep it very clinical, but I think it'll, you'll appreciate the pathophysiology. Then we'll talk a little bit about the classification and management of stable COPD, and then we'll talk about acute exacerbations, because this is the, the bread and butter of, of what you do in, in uh, looking and managing at COPD. So I'm just going to give the simple definition. This comes from the latest global initiative on obstructive lung disease report. Everyone, I hope, has heard about the gold criteria. This is kind of what, what we use. This is the kind of stuff you're going to see on the, on the tests and the boards, although there are other ways to classify COPD and severity and so forth. Gold is, is the gold standard for sure. So COPD, very broad definitions characterized by persistent airflow limitations. So unlike asthma, we have some fixed airways disease. We don't have, we can't have some reversibility, but it's not as much or full reversibility as we would expect in asthma. Um, and it's in, uh, associated with its own special type of chronic inflammatory response, very different from the asthmatic inflammatory response from an immune, immunopathological basis. I'm not really going to go into that too much today because I, I really want to keep it clinical and, and show you some, some hit, hit some key points and highlight some things that you may not know. And it says it's an, it, an inflammatory response in the airways and the lung to noxious particles or gases. And you notice it doesn't say tobacco. It says noxious particles and gases. And I'll, I want to emphasize a few points about that as we move forward as well. Um, I start out with this slide because I want you to read the top. You're going to be hearing a lot about this, this project. It was a huge project that's already uh, completed. Uh, there's been billions of bits of data collected ready to be used. Uh, blood work has been collected, tissues to do all sorts of uh, interesting studies to look at mainly genetic factors and also look at some clinical uh, uh, issues. So this was a, the COPD gene study was supported by your tax dollars and the COPD Foundation, which is a nonprofit. It was multi-center, 21 sites in the United States, and it recruited 10,000 smokers. Okay, 10,000 smokers. The big the, I see problem number one there is, is that a lot of people in this country are non-smokers and also have COPD. More to follow momentarily on that. So anyway, 4,000 of the folks had an FEV1, FEC ratio of greater than 0.7, and some of you may already know that according to the gold criteria, to have obstructive airways disease or obstructive physiology, the FEV1 to FEC ratio is less than 0.7, okay? So these were smokers did not have obstruction by the gold criteria. Their FEV ones were essentially at the, from the low end of the normal range, which is about 80% predicted all the way up to whatever, 120. So these were people without problems, but there were 4,000 smokers, important to, to note. <clears throat> they had 2,000 people who were at risk. In other words, they, they, they may have some symptoms that are suggestive of COPD. They present clinically as COPD, but they may not meet the, 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 the hallmarks of the 0.7 or the 80%. Um, uh, it, below that to, to count as, as COPD. And then they had 4,000 gold stage 2 to 4, which is really the bulk of the population that we tend to see clinically. This is when people get sick enough to come to the doctor and, uh, and, and complain about their disease. They didn't mean to, but they ended up using 100 non-smokers so that they could do some comparisons when they did their genetic studies and, and some other things, but they included 100 non-smokers. And the goal was a twofold for this study, assess genetic factors associated with COPD, I'm not going to say much about that because it's still somewhat early and there really isn't information in there that we can apply clinically yet. But remember chromosome 15 and remember uh, loci there that may be associated with a nicotinic receptor. Kind of interesting. We always think of nicotine as the addictive substance and the rest of the 4,000 chemicals is the stuff that causes disease. But actually, nicotine may have a role. And, and so that's a little bit exciting, but, but it's too early to talk about, maybe in the next uh, 7 to 10 years. Uh, what I'm going to talk more about is the, is the second goal. What they did is they used uh, um, uh, the, the ever-improving uh, multi-detector CT technology to look at, at, at COPD and see if they could use CT correlates to look at all sorts of things, uh, uh, COPD progression, uh, predicting acute exacerbations, et cetera, and I have a, some interesting stuff I want to show you about that. Um, there's an interesting link to the COPD gene, uh, which is kind of it's an easy one and fun to look at, so I, I encourage you to go through that. So the COPD gene genetic epidemiology study is something you, you need to remember. All right. Now, I, I can't talk about the, the CT without or, or get you excited when you see these CTs because you see them all the time unless you really understand how the lung works. And this is the functional unit of the lung. 
You know, we all understand the, the renal docs have been really good at this. We all see a glomerulus in our head. That's where everything happens. What, 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 what is the equivalent in the lung? And it's the secondary lobule here. The secondary lobule is outlined by this yellow line here. It's about one to two centimeters in its, you know, in its diameter. So it's easily detected by the CT scan. All right? These happen to be along the pleura, but they're located in these little shapes all throughout the lung parenchyma. And the functional units here are you have a terminal bronchiole, which is the last of the conducting airways. No gas exchange happens in terminal bronchioles, but right beyond that you have the respiratory bronchioles, the alveolar ducts, and then the alveolar sacs, and that's, the, that's where the gas exchange occurs. And that's kind of outlined here. All right? So what you're looking at here is a terminal bronchiole. Running along with the terminal bronchiole is the pulmonary artery, the blue blood, the stuff coming from the right heart. It forms the plexi of capillaries around the alveoli, and then they pick up the oxygen, they turn red, and then it returns via the pulmonary veins. The veins do not return along the same pathway as the pulmonary arteries, they return along the septa of the secondary lobules. So they kind of, the capillaries are here, the blue comes in here, they join up, and then they come out here through the pulmonary veins, and then they go on back to the left heart and, 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 and the rest you, you, you know. Uh, running along the septi of each of these secondary lobules is the lymphatic system as well. So when you have pulmonary edema, you see the curly lines and so on. What you're looking at are the, are, are the thickening of the, uh, of the septi of the secondary lobules. Normally these things are less than one millimeter in, in, in diameter, so you can't really see them on, even on a high resolution scan. But, um, but uh, that, that's the functional unit of, of the lung. So please remember that because when we inhale tobacco smoke, it starts here. All the activity is starting here, the, the pathophysiology when you get it. This is just um, uh, the, the term that you hear a lot, and I'm going to be using a lot, is centrilobular, and you see this blue dot in the middle, in the center of the secondary lobule, and here's where we're going to be talking about our, 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 our disease, uh, our, our COPD, and, and what it might mean um, in, in terms of, our, of clinical usage in, down, down the road. Um, some of these uh, pictures uh, are quite old. This is from 1947. This is kind of an intravital stain. It depicts them very nicely, the secondary lobule here. And what you have is a terminal bronchiole, and you have the, the tufts of different respiratory bronchioles kind of coursing throughout, and then all the alveoli kind of stuck out here, on the, uh, out, you know, radiating out from these. This is a higher power. You see here a terminal bronchiole leading into this tuft of uh, respiratory bronchioles, and then the alveoli all around that. This is, a, uh, this is a high resolution micro CT. So I don't know the technology, but, you, but they're able to cut, do very, uh, you know, almost like using a CT scanner like a microscope. Terminal bronchiole, see it's nice and thick, there's no gas exchange there. You start getting into the respiratory bronchioles here, you've got some alveolar ducts, and then you've got your alveoli out here. The surface area of the alveoli is such that it'll cover 150 square meters if I line up your cells one to one. Tremendous surface area. Depending on your size, we have 250 to 750 million alveoli in our body. So there's a lot of stuff for tobacco to destroy. And it takes a lot of destruction for, for people to, to, to come to you clinically. So a lot of damage has, has happened. In the lower panels, you start seeing, uh, this is the centrilobular emphysema. CLE stands for centrilobular emphysema. So what you're seeing here are this, these areas of darkness. This is where the bronchioles, alveoli, have been destroyed by the noxious gases that they talked about, that the definition describes uh, creating these emphysematous pockets, if you will. This is just a, a cut through an H&E stain. And you see this large space in here, some fibrosis around it, okay, because the, the continuous exposure to tobacco smoke creates this uh, uh, inflama inflama chronic inflammatory phenomenon that theoretically is what makes the FEV1 drop over, over many years and, and worsen the disease. Certainly people keep smoking. And then this is just another, I guess, sort of three-dimensional cut view of a lung showing these large cystic areas where probably in this area you might have had several secondary lobules that were just totally obliterated and formed one large cystic cavity. Okay. <clears throat> so Many of you, I'm sure, have seen a picture somewhat like this, especially if you've rotated on the pulmonary service and we're looking at a lot of CT scans. Here's kind of a drawing of what's happening in, in, uh, in this slice in particular. You see a lot of darkness, all of these holes. These are all secondary lobules that have been destroyed by 
the noxious gas or the, by the by the t or particles or t in tobacco smoke. And you can see here again. Here's our secondary lobule. You can see this uh, these dots in here demonstrate how the the disease is destroying um, is destroying alveoli from you know centrally moving outward. So this is why we call it centrilobular emphysema, and we see this a lot. Uh, another flavor of emphysema is called panlobular, and you can see in both of these pictures what's happening here is that these secondary lobules are becoming totally, totally obliterated, and you can see these huge areas, regions of just of air. There's really no gas exchange surface surface left in here. This is not nearly as common as the centrilobular pattern. The centrilobular pattern is by far the most common that we will see. Okay. And then this is what, can, this is what some people call paraseptal emphysema, but the COPD gene folks call pleural-based emphysema. And what you see is just uh, these, these septi that are all around the, the peripheral part of the lung parenchyma. This is not like IPF. This is not pulmonary fibrosis. These are, this is destruction of lung tissue and then these, these large strands of, of fibrotic material around that. You can see that depicted here in, the, in, the, in this um, drawing. I'm not showing you bullous disease. That's a, that's a whole other um, uh, aspect that, that, that really doesn't correlate to many clinical features or, or risk assessments that we do in COPD. These are the, th there are the features that the COPD gene study is using with the 10,000 CT scans that they've, uh, that they've obtained, and, and there's some interesting information that we're parsing out there. Uh, I can see a time where, you know, in interstitial lung disease, the high, we live by the high-resolution scan. I can see a time where we're, we're going to be assessing COPD with, uh, with high-resolution scans and looking for certain features, a couple of which I'm going to mention now. So one large study, this is by Dr. Uh, Castaldi, and actually this has not yet come out of the Blue Journal. If you're a member of the ATS, you can log on and actually get the article before it's published. So this is coming out. This is hot off the press. But they dipped into the COPD gene database and got 9,313 smokers from the study. And what they did, they, were, they took an expert radiologist, and I was intrigued as to why they only had one radiologist, but that's the way it was. And, and this individual looked at 250 uh, CT scans and graded the central lobular emphysema. Up to this point, CT scanning had been used in a broad sense to try to uh, assess the severity of COPD, risk factors, and so on. Um, they would do a histogram of the entire lungs, and if it was less than minus 950 Hausfeld units, they said, well, that's emphysema, let's, let's play with that. So they're trying to do better now. What they're doing now is that in, in this, this training set of 250 uh, CT scans, the radiologists looked at over 1,000 areas that were called regions of interest, the ROIs. So they're looking, they're dividing the lung into 1,000 regions, and they're looking at the central lobular, the changes there, and they were graded as mild, moderate, or severe. So what they're trying to do is establish some, some gradient so we can see some thresholds down the road that might be useful to look at to be able to grade the COPD, assess severity, whatever you want to look at. So uh, then when they had the 250 training sets, then they put the data into the computer, and then they looked at all 9,313 uh, smokers and, <clears throat> and tried to correlate some of these findings along with the um, you know, lung function studies, uh, quality of life measures, et cetera. All right. So what they found, just to show you some, some uh, key findings, is the severity of uh, centrilobular emphysema correlated directly with the FEV1, dyspnea, six-minute walk distance, and exacerbation. So the higher the grade of the centrilobular emphysema, uh, it, it correlated nicely with certain, um, sorry about that, with uh, certain very important parameters that we use in, uh, to, to uh, assess or, or determine severity in, in COPD. So more to come on that. This hasn't come out yet. You probably aren't going to see anything on the tests uh, about centrilobular emphysema and how it correlates to, to disease parameters in COPD. Maybe the fellows will see it in the next two to three years, but it's still a little ways down. What was really interesting was that the presence of mild centrilobular emphysema in the control smokers, and remember, these were the smokers who really didn't have much in the way of symptoms. They had PFTs that looked essentially normal. But when they did these folks and they found centrilobular emphysema to a mild degree, as you might expect, it would be mild in people who don't have the pulmonary function abnormalities, it predicted when you push these people, when you looked at them as a group, that indeed their FEV1s are already lower than the people without centrilobular emphysema. Uh, dyspnea was, was more prominent. Six-minute walk distances were shorter, and they tended to have more exacerbations than people who did not have the centrilobular emphysema. 
So here we may be looking at a tool that's going to allow us to pick up COPD earlier than we can pick it up by normal daily activity symptoms, by, uh, no, by looking at finding normal PFT and just saying, well, you're a smoker, your PFT are normal, you know, so far you're okay, quit smoking, hang in there, that kind of thing. If we can maybe find some abnormalities uh, based on, on studies like this, we may be able to employ the CT scanner uh, earlier and, and really drill down on people who maybe get short of breath on, on moderate activity or, or, or you can't figure out why they're, why they're dysmic. So to me, that's, that's one of the exciting things down the road. Stay tuned. Don't forget the COPD gene study. Okay, another area that I think is kind of underappreciated is COPD in never smokers. Here in the United States, about 5% of never smokers have significant fixed airflow obstruction. Now obviously this is a very heterogeneous population. You may have people who are not very active, they sit around all the time, they have COPD, they have airflow obstruction, they never feel it because their activity level never takes them there. But then you have some people that are very active and they'll feel it. They say, well, doc, I never smoked. And uh, you, know, you do the workup, you do the pulmonary function testing, you might find some airflow obstruction, and you go, hmm, what's been going on? Now obviously you have to get a very good uh, exposure type history. Um, uh, in, in other countries, for example, where in third world countries where they have a lot of indoor cooking and poor ventilation, the, 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 the incidence of, of uh, COPD in never smokers is 20, 30 percent, especially in the poor women who have to cook in there and the, and the stoves aren't ventilated. Dr. Roman gives a very good lecture on this biomass, uh, you know, bronchitis, bronchiectasis thing. So I, th I think we're not really appreciating COPD in never smokers, all right? The predispositions for this, just in a broad nutshell, uh, multiple childhood respiratory infections seem to predispose to that, okay? A family history of asthma, all right? Indoor, outdoor pollution, and we're learning more and more about that. People with increased bronchial hyper-responsiveness, -respons and then people with inadequate lung development. And what's really very interesting is women who smoke while they're pregnant, their children tend to be, uh, when they're born, tend to be a little bit uh, below birth weight, and their lung size is compromised. Their lungs, their lungs are smaller than uh, comparable babies to, born to mothers who are not smokers. In Kentucky, we're number one in pregnant women smoking, as an aside. Okay. Some, some unique features uh, of, of COPD in, in never smokers, and to me they're a little bit frustrating because uh, we really need to understand them better. You don't have the s same systemic inflammatory response of tobacco and do COPD. Think about it. The, the, the tobacco is constantly irritating the, the lungs. The lungs are kind of the, uh, the window to the rest of our bodies. There's a lot of absorption of, of toxic chemicals. And there's this low-grade chronic inflammation, which actually we're, we're, you can measure by looking at CRP, uh, looking at fi fibr fibrinogen and fibrinogen-derived peptides. There are a few other interesting biomarkers that the COPD gene study is looking at. None of them are in use yet. Um, to, to monitor COPD, but it is a chronic smoldering inflammatory disease. T tumor necrosis factor levels are up. People who smoke are hypercoagulable as well. So there's a lot of activity going on uh, in people with tobacco uh, or, or uh, noxious induced COPD. Not the same thing with people who are never smokers, so we don't see that. The obstructive phenomenology is predominantly via airway remodeling, and this is what we think happens in people with asthma over time. We think that if it's not well controlled over time, the airways stay inflamed, they thicken, and then they become fixed like that. So it's predominantly an airway remodeling and then bronchiolitis if it goes all the way down into the terminal and respiratory bronchioles, okay? And what's really frustrating is that never smokers with COPD are deliberately excluded from clinical trials. So we may have a never smoker who has PFTs and with fixed airways and we treat them with like COPD, but who knows if they respond to you know, anticholinergics or, or the beta agonists or, or, or even inhaled corticosteroids. No one knows if there's really any efficacious drug out there for these individuals and no one has done studies in, in, a, in this group. So just another thing to take home, all right? All right. All right, so now to the more uh, practical and mundane things. Hopefully everyone will stay awake. Talk a little bit about the diagnosis of COPD. We'll talk about managing stable COPD and finish off looking at the uh, acute exacerbations of COPD. All right, the COPD, uh, it's like most lung diseases, very nonspecific presentation. Okay, dyspnea and cough happen in every lung disease you can think, think of. The key feature here, and I'll hit on this a, couple, a few times, is the is sputum production. We make about 100 cc's of mucus every day that, we, that our mucociliary tree brings up, and we just don't even think about it. It goes above the cords, we go <clears throat> like this, and we swallow it, no big deal. 
Anytime sputum crosses the lips, it's abnormal. So I'm, I, every time I get a, a bronchitis or something, an acute bronchitis, and I cough up phlegm, that's, that's not normal. It hasn't happened in a while, thank goodness, and hopefully well, it's miserable. So, so sputum production is not normal under any circumstances, but, but it's a big deal when it comes to uh, in COPD, as, as we'll get to in terms of predicting infection and, and, and that kind of thing. Um, to diagnose COPD, obviously it's obstructive pulmonary disease, so you want to do spirometry, simple spirometry, meeting these criteria per gold, showing an FEV1 over FEC ratio of less than 0.7, okay? There are some people that argue about this, especially in our elderly folks. If you're 80 years old, the average FEV1 over FEC in a healthy 80-year-old is about, oh, about 67. Is this individual obstructed? You know, I leave that as a question. I don't, I'm not going to give you the answer, and I don't expect an answer from you because no one really has the answer. A lot of argument about it. But nevertheless, this, this number is really, it, it's, it's, it's easy to keep in mind, uh, and, and this is really what we're using. This is the gold criteria. This is what, the, what we use in our clinical trials when we enroll people into the studies. This is the magic number. So this is what you're going to see on the boards. Less than 0.7 is obstructive. All right. Um, what's really interesting is here is that the symptoms Cough and sputum may actually precede any airflow limitation. So you have a person who's got a cough going on for several weeks, perhaps, and they're making sputum, and you do PFTs, and they look pretty normal. You say, you're okay, just you know, stop smoking or, or get another job, get away from whatever you're inhaling, et cetera. Uh, uh, you know, that may or may not be true. Um, uh, dyspnea, wheezing, and weight loss are very late signs. So by the time they come to you with these types of signs or presentations or clinical findings, you are definitely going to see obstruction. And by then, a lot of damage could have been done. So, so I'm, I'm just trying to give you a little bit more of a hair trigger. So you have patients coming to your clinic who may have fairly normal PFTs, but yet they've got a cough that won't go away. You've ruled out GERD. You've ruled out you know, upper respiratory syndromes, that kind of thing. Still think that they might have COPD, especially if they're smokers. And maybe five years from now, you'll order a high-res scan. You'll see some mild sensory lobular emphysema. And you'll say, there it is. Okay, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm sort of speculating, but, but that's what I anticipate would happen. And certainly, you're never smokers. Don't forget that COPD could still be an issue in, in these individuals. Just kind of a refresher on, on simple spirometry. This was from a healthy pulmonary fellow at Emory many years ago. Uh, took a deep breath in and blew it out. You see this curve that I'm, many of you are familiar with. And on the y-axis, we have uh, volume in liters. And on the x-axis, we have time in seconds. And his predicted F force vital capacity for his size, for his height, his age, his gender, and his race is here in purple. He actually did a little bit better than that. Okay? And you'll notice, too, that he plateaus out at about four seconds. So a healthy individual from a forced expiratory maneuver can get all the air out, all the vital capacity out in three to four seconds. All right? The important number that everyone knows about is the FEV1. So he gets all this air out in the very first second. Right? And you can see here, look at all this. He's getting over you know, about five and a half liters out in the first second and then just a very little bit less, much less after that. So that gives him a ratio of 0.83. So for him, and he was, I think, at the time like 28 or 29, his FEV1 over FEC was 0.83, which is 100% of predicted. So in a young person, you got very high FEV1. So I wonder if he were to get, become ill and drop his FEV1 over FEC to 0.75, would I still call that normal? You know, that's the conundrum. So, so be a little cautious about that 0.7. Uh, use it, because that's, that's what you're going to see. That's what we use in practice. That's what you'll see on the test. But, but remember that it can, it can, it can fool you. Uh, in COPD, obviously, we're going to see a different type of spirogram. I'm sure many of you are anticipating that already. But this is a lung from a, a transplant. Well, this was why the person was transplanted. You can see here, this is a person with COPD. Just to demonstrate loss of uh, tissue here, this is more, would be more like pan lobar emphysema here. And what happens is you lose airway tethering, okay, so the airways become floppy. You know, nice elastic lungs keep the airways open, all right? So what happens then, obviously, when someone does a forced expiration, the airways flop down and all the air takes a lot longer to get out, to escape the mouth. And you can see here this veteran from, uh, from Atlanta, his spirogram, you can see this long slope here. He's barely plateaued out. He's still at eight seconds and probably could go further, but the machine stops at eight seconds. Here's his predicted vital capacity. Theoretically, if he kept exhaling all the way out to the wall here, he might reach that FVC. 
And I've seen people exhale for 24, 24, 25 seconds. I've seen people with COPD exhale that long and they just keep blowing and blowing and you know, you're waving at them and they're just happily blowing and blowing and blowing because they're so obstructive. So that's where he is there. The predicted FEV1 is here and this is where his FEV1 was, way down here. His ratio is extremely low, 0.28. Now that's a no-brainer, okay? This tells you that the person is obstructed. It doesn't tell you anything about what the FEV1 is. It doesn't tell you anything about the FEC. It doesn't tell you about severity or, or, or classification. It just tells you that, uh, that, you're, um, that you're obstructed. I, I kind of par took this slide from a, from a presentation of a colleague in, in Washington uh, and put it up here because even as far back as 1975, it was very clear that the level of obstruction had some relationship uh, with mortality or survival here, I should say. Uh, this is the expected survival here on the y-axis you have the survival and down here we have years of observation you can see people with the terrible terrible fev ones once you get below a leader in an adult human being you got to really worry about things like uh, secondary pulmonary hypertension these are the people going to come in with the uh, you know the edema of the lower extremities um, and and weight loss uh, and, and the mortality is very high in these individuals about 60 percent per year and then you have the different levels of fev1 you can see that str how it stratifies out so it's not good to have low FEV ones. Let's see here. Um, just to kind of uh, wrap up a little bit on, on, on the assessment of COPD, chest films can present in many different ways. For all practical purposes, you might say, well, this looks fairly normal. It may look a little hyperinflated. It looks a little dirty, perhaps. And indeed, you see kind of this schmutzy stuff here. In radiologists, we'll call that like dirty parenchyma, and sometimes we see that in, in COPD where you have this respiratory bronchiolitis. Every smoker has respiratory bronchiolitis. If you look hard enough, you're going to find inflammation in the bronchioles. And for many people, it doesn't, it's not symptomatic, but every smoker has bronchiolitis. So you can see a dirty film uh, all the way to this, which everyone recognizes is the hyperinflated chest with an increased retrosternal airspace, uh, very flattened diaphragms, and these are the people that when you put them in a body box are going to have huge lungs they're going to be way over distended because you've destroyed the lung, the recoil of the lung is, is shot and the thoracic chest wall sproings out and it makes the chest bigger than it should be. Don't see that in asthma because in asthma the lung parenchyma remains normal. You never see an over distended or hyper inflated lung in asthma but you can see a heck of a lot of uh, air trapping as you do in COPD. Air trapping is common to both but over distension of the lung is a finding in COPD. All right, so uh, going back to like 1997 or so, the, 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 uh, the folks at the Global Initiative got together and were trying to, to use spirometry, trying to, uh, you know, recognizing that the FEV1 correlated with survival and so on, and tried to establish some thresholds that might inform us on risks and might, in, might give us some advice on how to treat these individuals at different risk levels. And I'm sure many of you are familiar with this. And when you sit down with us in the pulmonary consult service and we look at PFTs, we're always talking about these stages, the gold stages, and based on our ratios and then looking at the, the, the uh, predictors of the FEV1, we can classify them into one of these four regions. Uh, this paradigm worked really well until 2007, which was the, the previous iteration of the gold criteria. The, the latest one just came out this year, and I'm going to get to that next because that's the one you have to remember now. Okay. But I really like this one. It was real nice and simple. You didn't have to ask the patient if they were making mucus. You didn't have to ask them how many exacerbations they had. Is that one? Okay. Um, okay. Uh, so, um, so we all we had to do was to look at the spirometry. Didn't have to really take much other into consideration, and we could sort of predict risks. And you, if you look at risk for hospitalization, if you look at risk for mortality, there is a gradation here. I mean, that, that was clearly found, all right? We'll, we'll hit a little bit more on the therapies as we move to the more modern times, but, uh, but you can see here for the very milder forms, mild and moderate, obviously everyone um, needs to have their vaccinations. Short-acting bronchodilator, albuterol in this country is the main one used when needed for all of these gradations. For the very mild, that's, that's sufficient. For the folks who are obstructed but have an FEV1 between 50 and 80, which is moderate, you know, add regular treatment with a long-acting bronchodilator. I'll have more to say about that momentarily. And then when you get to this magic number here of an FEV1 of around 50% or less, this is when we start talking about adding the inhaled glucocorticoids. Okay? This is a double-edged sword, as I'll get to momentarily. So we shouldn't add glucocorticoids willy-nilly. I see glucocorticoids used a lot in patients who have COPD, and, and, uh, and I think we really need to pay more attention to the, uh, to the severity. 
as I get to momentarily. So between 2007 and, and uh, 2013, and actually in 2011 is when the first papers started coming out that were really looking at this a little bit harder and say, well, yeah, it's, it's great to look at the different stages, as you can see here on this side of the square, but we also might have some good information in terms of symptoms, if we understand the symptoms better, and then also numbers of exacerbations. What if we put all these things together into a new paradigm? Let's add them to the spirometry to see if we can get extra information, maybe a, a better idea of, of risks and, and, uh, yeah, uh, and, and so forth. So here's what the, the paradigm that we came up with. I'm going to show you in a minute what the MRC and CAT look like. This is the uh, Modified Medical Research Council, which... Uh, uh, which was it, it was a British measure of, of, of symptoms, and then this is the COPD assessment test, which is a, uh, here. And then the, the, the scores, if the score is low in these two, it puts you in this category. The scores, as you see here, is more than two for MRC and more than 10 for CAT, it puts you in this category here, all right? So, so if you have a lot of symptoms, all right, if you've had two exacerbations or more in a year, and you're stage four, stage three or four, you get put in the worst category. All right. So these are the people that you would predict have the highest risk for mortality. These are the people you predict would need the most complex medical regimen to, to maintain them. And it, and it does work out that way. And I'll develop that here a little bit more. But, in, but, but roughly it does work out that way. Interestingly, a paper came out very recently comparing the 2007 criteria, which was just only the, the spirometry versus the whole kit and caboodle. And they're both pretty pretty equal predictors. There's really not much of a change. But nevertheless, this is what you're going to be seeing from, from now until, who knows, 2015. This is an example of the uh, COPD assessment test. It has eight questions. We're not going to go through each of these questions, but zero is good, five is bad. Uh, and you can add all of these up to get the highest score, and that's really terrible. And you notice on the, in the previous slide, a score of 10 or more is predictive of significant symptoms that put you in the more severe category. Okay, so if you're going to do a CAT uh, in your clinic, give this to the patient and you see a score of 10 or more, that's going to already put you in the, in the higher risk category. Or you can use this. This is what we use in the HCOC clinic here. Um, we use the, the, the Medical Research Council questionnaire. It has four grades. You can see here, for example, grade zero, I only get breathless with strenuous exercise, which hopefully is most of us here, all the way to four, I am too breathless to leave the house or I am breathless when dressing or undressing. Okay, and a score of two or more on this one puts you in the high symptom group. All right, so you can use either one of those two. All right. Okay, so keep that in mind. So the, the concept now is that you had the 2007 criteria based on spirometry. Wonderful, we've been using them all along. Still good, we think. But now we've added symptoms and exacerbations to the mix, and that's how we have to think about it in a more dimensional way when we make assessment of our patients with COPD. Let's talk a little bit about some of the therapeutic uh, uh, agents. <coughs> we use the term bronchodilator. Um, uh, this is obvious, but I need to repeat it because, because I do. Bron bronchodilator is an agent that increases airway caliber through smooth muscle relaxation, something that acts in real time, something that's going to give relief either immediately, like with our short-acting drugs, or uh, over a period of an hour or more with our long-acting drugs. Okay. In, inhaled corticosteroids are not bronchodilators, they're anti-inflammatory drugs. I'll say a little bit more about them in, in a few moments. Delivery systems matter, okay? A lot of our delivery systems these days are dry, or what we call DPIs, or dry powder inhalers. So imagine somebody with terrible COPD, they're very hyperinflated, they blow out, you know, the size of a Coke can, and they're expected to take in a deep breath and take this powder all the way down deep into the lungs. No, it doesn't happen. The more severe the disease, the more central deposition you get, and that can be a problem, you know, with efficacy of the drug. So we have to take that into consideration. Uh, another concept, you know, nebulized bronchodilators. These are the things that we use in the ER. A lot of people have nebulizers at home, and what you will notice is, that instead of microgram doses, you're looking at milligram doses. So orders of magnitude higher drugs. Um, they do improve subjective relief during exacerbation. So try to. Uh, uh, use the nebulized approach more for people who are getting out of control, who are destabilized, who are in acute exacerbation. Uh, uh, bronchodilators do improve symptoms. They do reduce exacerbations. I'll say a little bit more about that. But they do not decrease disease progression and they do not affect survival. There are only two things that, that, that s slow disease progression 
and improve survival. One is quitting smoking or getting away from the noxious agent, and number two is supplemental oxygen if they qualify, if they, if the, if they need oxygen. Those are the only two things. Everything else is good for symptom relief, but it doesn't change the, the dynamics. Um, it, it in general, it doesn't change the dynamics. Um, this is just pictures. I'm not promoting any of these. These are up here are the, the meter dose inhalers. They've been out since the 1960s, starting with that primatine mist that made everyone's heart race up to that nonspecific <laughs> beta agonist that made everyone's heart race. These are the meter dose inhalers, uh, powered meter dose inhalers. These are dry powdered inhalers, very common ones that you're familiar with. Um, and these are the ones that, as a person becomes more and more severe, have, have difficulty getting into the, um, getting into the right place. And then, of course, the liquid nebulized preps are here. You can see some of those. Um, lots of them. Um, I'd like to go back. All right. These are other types of, this is a dry powder inhaler. They all look a little bit different. They're, they work different mechanically. So it's very important to, to make sure your patient understands how to use the device. They can become quite complicated. So beta-2 agonists, they work by increasing cyclic AMP, which translates into uh, smooth muscle relaxation. Albuterol is short-acting. Uh, formoterol and salmeterol last 12 hours. Formoterol has a fairly rapid onset, very similar to albuterol within minutes. Salmeterol probably peaks at about an hour out, okay? The studies over time, you can name the studies. Probably the, the most famous study looking at at, at these drugs is the, the TORCH study. We were part of that. It was four years long, over 4,000 individuals. It was uh, a very revealing study. Intercaterol is, is uh, you haven't seen it yet on the market. It's coming out. It's a 24-hour preparation. It has enhanced bronchodilator effects versus formoterol and salmeterol with maybe like a 15 to 20 percent improvement or, or benefit greater than, than these other drugs. So stay tuned for this one. The adverse effects of the beta agonist, as you might imagine, could be tremor. Uh, and of course, hypokalemia, because beta agonist stimulation drives uh, potassium into cells. So when you've got people in the ICU or in the ER and you're giving them tons of beta agonists, watch out for hypokalemia. Uh, and it also in, and it increases O2 consumption. So you have to be careful about that. Anticholinergics, they block the effect of acetylcholine on muscarinic receptors. There's a whole uh, isotypes of muscarinic receptors, they do different things, but M1 and M3 are the ones that are most responsible for contracting and relaxing smooth muscle. So when acetylcholine hits one of these, the, the, the smooth muscle contracts and you get bronchoconstriction. So the anticholinergics are very good at blocking these receptors and not allowing them to do that when acetylcholine is around. And acetylcholine is like methacholine. We do methacholine challenge tests. It's a very potent bronchoconstrictor, right? So we, if we block acetylcholine, we can, we can in, in, enhance smooth muscle relaxation. Um, the studies show that clearly the antimuscarinics improve the quality of life. They do reduce exacerbations and hospitalizations, which is a nice thing, because it is thought that every time you exacerbate, you're taking, you're taking the rate of FEV1 decline down much faster. And then when you recover, you don't recover back up to your baseline, you're a little bit lower. So the more exacerbations you have, the faster you're gonna progress overall. So if we can increase the interval between uh, uh, exacerbations, we can hopefully slow down the progression of, of the disease. Uh, of course, having good bronchodilation improves uh, performance in pulmonary rehabilitation. Okay, a little bit to say about the anti-muscarinics. It's been known for some time that there may be some cardiovascular issues with the uh, muscarinic agents, and uh, especially with stroke uh, and perhaps MI, so that, that raised a lot of uh, concerns. The dry powder inhaler was used in the Uplift study, which is a very large study, often referenced study, very well done, randomized placebo-controlled study, which demonstrated that the dry powder formulation shown here did, in fact, not show any difference with the, between placebo in terms of these cardiovascular effects. However, there is a preparation here called the Respi mat, which is the FDA has not approved in this country, but it's used in other parts of the world, where indeed there has been shown an increased mort all-cause mortality, actually, by using this drug. Now, it's, it's very small, but clearly is the, 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 the signal is there. What's interesting is this is 18 micrograms here from the dry powder inhaler. This is five or 10 micrograms. And when you measure the levels of the drug in the blood, it can be up to three times higher using the recipe mat versus using the handy inhaler. So more to come on that. I don't know that we're gonna be seeing the recipe mat in this country until things get sorted out. So, so be, be aware of that. Nevertheless, the anti-muscarinics are, are, are extremely uh, good drugs to use in, in the more, certainly in the more severe cases. Inhaled corticosteroids and their controversial benefit um, uh, in, in COPD. 
the, the problem is, is that they're, the studies have not really done a dose response. We don't really have a good idea about dose responses. We tend to use them in practice at about half the dose that we would use in asthma. You know, we talk about we're, we're a little bit concerned, especially because what we see is that inhaled corticosteroids are even used in combination with the, uh, with the long-acting beta agonists do increase the, prop, the, the risk of developing pneumonia. So we have to be very careful with the inhaled corticosteroids. That story is still developing. And so we tend to reserve them in patients who have uh, more moderate to bordering on severe FEV1. Remember I showed you in the 2007 criteria that cut point when the FEV1 was less than 50 percent, then, uh, then you would consider inhaled corticosteroids. Well, we're still there. So when you're looking at moderate, kind of pushing towards the severe side and certainly to the severe side, we do get benefits from inhaled corticosteroids, and we, but we have to keep in mind the, uh, the, the side effects. Pneumonia just being one, but these people, COPD does does cause osteopenia, and it can enhance osteopenia. So there are other steroid effects that you could get, even from inhaled steroids, so you have to be careful with them. Um, but they clearly um, are very useful in moderate to severe COPD. They do, have a, they do make a dent, and the TORCH study showed this, in all-cause mortality when you use them in combination. Not by themselves, but in combination, it appears to have some, some effect there. Um, just not the kind of complete things, theophylline is a non-selective inhibitor of phosphodiesterase. It's been around, geez, six, seven, 60, 70 decades. It's not used very much anymore because the more modern drugs are much better at bronchodilation. But uh, nevertheless, it can be used, in, especially at low doses, to help reduce exacerbations. I use it very infrequently. I only use it in patients I've tried, I've optimized, and they're still having frequent exacerbations. I'll use theophylline. Of course, I have to follow the levels, et cetera. Reflumilast is probably the, the, is the specific phosphodiesterase 4 inhibitor, which inhibits metabolism of cyclic AMP, so it stays up. Muscles stay, smooth muscles stay relaxed. It does improve lung function and decreases exacerbations, but it has to be used in combination with something else. It should not be used by itself. I've used it less than a handful of times, and unfortunately, I've, 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 I've drawn the short straw every time. It causes a lot of significant side effects, especially GI side effects. Patients have not been very happy with me when I've given it, but then, of course, you know, I've only used it a few times, so I'm biased. But uh, uh, supposedly, it does, um, have, it does give extra efficacy to the therapy if you add it to, to some other uh, modality. Okay, so coming back to the current gold 2013 criteria, talk to, uh, and we talked about the 2007, and how you look at the different severities in, in spirometry and how you treat those. Well, here's how it breaks down for this. The, the mildest form is going to be here with a very low symptom score, either mild or moderate, you know, mild or moderate COPD, very few exacerbations, that's class A. A short-acting bronchodilator, like a short-acting uh, beta agonist or a short-acting muscarinic antagonist, like, like hypertropium, that's perfectly fine to use, uh, is, is, is the recommendation right now. Okay, you slide over to B, few exacerbations, still mild to moderate, but having more symptoms, you've got to start thinking about a long-term, a longer-term, uh, or, or longer-acting, if you will, uh, uh, drug. This would be long-acting beta agonist or long-acting muscarinic antagonist here. Using that alone, and of course, this, this for rescue as needed. Okay, as we move up the severity great blocks, if you will, if you have a lot of exacerbations, uh, then inhaled corticosteroids come into play here. You'll notice we're looking at kind of the severe range, just like we did for the 2007 criteria where we added inhaled corticosteroids. Not really much change when you look at this, but nevertheless, this is where we're sitting now. So the mildest is just a short acting. People with more symptoms but still low exacerbations, low risk, add a long acting beta agonist or muscular antagonist. And once you get into two or more exacerbations per year, and into the higher risk categories, and that's when you add the long-acting inhaled corticosteroids plus uh, a long-acting beta agonist. Uh, for class C, which has low symptom score, you can get away with just using a long-acting muscarinic antagonist, but when you have all three at, at a high level, then it's recommended to go ahead and, and, and perhaps add a LAMA. So I call this to my patients, you know, I, and, you know, the holy trinity of treatment of severe COPD, inhaled corticosteroids, beta agonist, long-acting beta agonist, and a LAMA, you know. So um, that's, that's how it breaks down now. This is what you're going to be seeing in the 2013 gold um, recommendations. Non-pharmacological interventions, just to mention, so you don't forget, I'm not going to go into depth, I don't have time for that. Smoking cessation is um, paramount, and there are many approaches to doing that. Uh, uh, supplemental oxygen, if it's needed, 
that's a whole different lecture in and of its own. Uh, vaccination, the influenza vaccine is evidence A, the highest evidence that clearly is beneficial in these individuals, so they must get that. The pneumovax, interestingly, is kind of like evidence CB. You know, a lot of these people are older, the immunogenicity of the pneumo pneumococcal vaccine is not nearly as good as using dead viruses. Um, pulmonary rehabilitation uh, in, improves conditioning and, and decreases dyspnea without changing pulmonary function. It doesn't do anything for pulmonary function. It improves the efficiency of uh, oxygen use, if you will. Lung volume reduction where it's indicated is a whole other talk in and of itself, bolectomy, and then in the end, uh, lung transplantation. COPD was the main reason for lung transplantation up to about five years ago, but now that we can keep these people alive a lot longer, we're thinking, we're having second thoughts about that. You have to be really sick to get a lung transplant for COPD. And here's some of the criteria that are used to get a lung transplant if you have COPD. All right, patients with a Bode index of seven to 10. The Bode index was a, is a recently described index that, that predicts uh, all cause mortality and, and respiratory mortality depending on, on how you want to use it. Um, and it uses the body mass index, so if you're very skinny and cachectic and wasted, that's not good. Level of obstruction, so the worse your obstruction, the worse it is, the scores go up. The numbers are getting worse now. Dyspnea scale, which is the MRC that I showed you, the, the worse that is, the higher the score. And then the exertion, which is the six minute walk distance. As the distance gets smaller, your numbers go up. The highest number you can get is 10. So if you're between seven and 10, you've got a pretty darn bad boat index. And, and your, your probability of dying within a year is about 40%. So that's, that's pretty serious. So that's where you can start thinking about lung transplant or some of these that you see down here. History of hospitalization associated with hypercapnia, pulmonary hypertension or core pulmonale is, you know, FEV1 is less than a liter. FEV1 of less than 20%, that's pretty darn low in a DLCO of less than 20%, okay? So you have to be pretty sick with COPD these days to get a lung transplant. Okay, we'll finish off quickly with uh, acute exacerbation of COPD. Uh, again, coming from the Gold Report, acute exacerbation of COPD is an acute event characterized by worsening of the patient's respiratory symptoms that, um, that are beyond normal day-to-day -day variations and lead to a change in medication. Very muddy uh, description, and, and it is, because what might be an exacerbation for one person may not be for the other individual. I think if a patient, one of my patients with COPD gets on the phone and complains, that's, that's, a, that's an exacerbation, at least mild. If they end up in the hospital, that's a severe exacerbation. Let's develop that a little bit more. Okay, why is it important to, to manage the, the uh, acute exacerbation, exacerbations? I sort of alluded to this before. We want to prevent the increased rate of FEV1 decline. FEV1 declines about 30% per year as we get older, after we become adults. In, uh, in, in, in the general population of smokers, it declines twice as fast, about 60 mLs per year, okay? Uh, and in people with COPD, it can decline. I have people who decline 300 cc's per year. So it's, it's highly variable, but it declines quickly. So every time you get an exacerbation, you're taking a big hit, and you never come back to where you were before the exacerbation. So we clearly want to avoid them. Um, of course, we want to avoid hospitalization and the associated mortality. If a person goes into the hospital and has to be intubated for an acute exacerbation, 10% of them will not make it out of the hospital, and 40% of them will die within a year. Okay, and within four years, 50% will be dead in, in terms of all-cause mortality. So making it to the hospital with an acute exacerbation is a bad thing. It costs a lot of money, and then the recovery can be extremely long, uh, and there's uh, all sorts of quality of life issues and, and so on, not just for the patient, but for the families who have to take care of them. Um, so how, how do we want to approach acute exacerbations? Well, it would be nice to be able to predict them. If they've had a history of prior exacerbations, and then I show, as I showed you on that new paradigm, if you have two exacerbations per year, you can darn well know that by the next year you're going to have an, at least another one, probably another two exacerbations. All right? If you had an exacerbation that required mechanical ventilation, you're going to get another one, All right, for sure. And then this is an interesting thing that also came out of the gene, um, uh, the COPD gene study. And what's interesting about this, you had large numbers of people, and what one of the studies looked at the diameter of the ascending aorta at its widest point where the pulmonary artery crosses. If you measure the diameter of the pulmonary artery, this is on CT scanning, and the pulmonary artery is larger in diameter than the aortic, uh, I'm sorry, yep, than the aortic artery, then that was predictive of people developing acute exacerbation. Now, this sort of translates to our work in pulmonary hypertension where when the pulmonary arteries are engorged, then it, 
it's consistent with pulmonary hypertension. One of the thoughts is that, well, these people are already pretty advanced. They have a very large pulmonary artery. They probably have pulmonary hypertension. They're sicker with COPD, so they're probably going to have an exacerbation. That's speculation, but nevertheless, that might be another way to use the CT scanning in our assessments of patients with COPD. If the PA looks at, especially plump, worry about exacerbations. What we want to do ultimately is prevent. Um, case management is a two talks in and of itself. I'll just give you an example of what we're doing here at, at, uh, at UofL with uh, employees. You know, that, that we all have United Healthcare, and we made a deal with the with the company. If you provide their medicines for free and they follow a program that's case managed, we have a case manager. Uh, and depending on the severity of the disease, they visit us every, every three months or every six months. We do frequent PFTs. If they have a problem, they call the case manager. The idea being is to prevent these acute exacerbations and keep them out of the ER, keep them out of the hospital. And Dr. Foltz is, uh, is heading that up and, and has some data. I, I, I don't know what the exact data is, but I see a lot of these patients, and I can't remember the last one that we've had to go to the hospital. I get the call from the case manager, and we, we take care of the problem right away. We're only doing this with our, with our employees here, but we're trying to pitch our plan to UPS and, and other entities in, in the community. The, the, the Canadians have done a great job in reducing costs by at least a third in treating COPD doing that. We haven't done, we're still kind of babies at this in this country, but the Canadians have done a great job. And then of course controlling the comorbidities. These folks have you know, terrible cardiovascular disease, they may be diabetic, peripheral vascular disease, you name it. Uh, th those issues need to be controlled as well. Stabilize the patient to avoid acute exacerbations. Diagnosis is a purely clinical diagnosis. It's a change from baseline, as I alluded to before. Causes the patient to seek medical help. Um, coming out of the COPD gene study, and that's not the only one. I'm just touting that one because I don't want you to forget it. Um, there may be some interesting biomarkers coming out of this. Uh, for example, looking at uh, the CRP. Uh, the CRP, which is a nice measure of chronic indolent smoldering inflammation. So a, a high CRP may be predictive. Looking at fibrinogen. Uh, we don't really don't look at tumor necrosis factor. There are other pro-inflammatory pro um, uh, uh, things that we can look at. Eosinophils is another one people are looking at. So high e as the eosinophil count goes up, these people are more prone to acute exacerbations. But the hallmark of not making this diagnosis is the sputum. If you've got more sputum, especially if it's turning yellow or brown or green or what have you, this is the hallmark for um, especially bacterial infection. Now, having said that, that, that's still a little bit muddy. If you go, if you do bronchoscopy and get lower airway secretions in people with COPD and acute exacerbations, you can culture many different types of bugs that are found in the respiratory tract, in the, in the mouth, and so on, for example. Or if you take stable patients with COPD, you can see the same thing. The microbiome is, is there. They, they seem to have the bugs below the, the, the cords where it's supposed to be sterile. So you can find it in acute exacerbations and not... It's probably a load effect. When you have an acute exacerbation, you just have a, there, there's like a bloom or whatever it, of, of the bugs, and it tips you over into an inflammatory response, which is the acute exacerbation. But when you have more sputum and it turns color, then we treat for, for bacterial inf infection. The early gold stages, we typically see strep pneumonia, H influenza, more excella cateralis. And when you get into the higher stages, you think about these, but more and more we're beginning to recognize that some of these folks have pseudomonas. So if you have someone in gold stage 3, 4, and they ain't getting better with their exacerbation, they're still, their, their sputum is still brown, start thinking about the, the possibility that there may be pseudomonas. Typically, you don't have to get blood, uh, sputum cultures before or during treatment for acute exacerbations. But in this scenario, if they're not responding, definitely do get cultures to see if, if there may be something that we're missing with our standard um, drugs. So uh, forget the first bullet. I was going to talk about that. I, I sort of covered that one. We're, we're still not sure what the, the, the floor can be found in non-sick non and sick individuals. and. You know, do antibiotics make a difference? It's still somewhat controversial. People are giving a lot more credit to the anti-inflammatory effects of antibiotics. The macrolides, as you may know, are very potent anti-inflammatory drugs, as are the tetracyclines. And then the quinolones also have a little bit of anti-inflammatory activity. So maybe it's not killing the bugs that are down there even before the exacerbation. It may be that we're just kind of cooling off the inflammatory response and the patients are getting better because of that. Okay. So um, clearly for people with these, these clinical findings, um, and these are placebo-controlled trials, from the, the, the designs are all very different. They use different drugs. They use different levels of, 
of severity and so on, so it's difficult to do a meta-analysis. You can start out with you know, 50 studies and then you, you do your meta-analysis, you can only use five because they met the criteria that you set uh, you know, a priori to do a meta-analysis. So they're, they're kind of difficult to do, but clearly uh, if, these, if folks have dyspnea, sputum volume, and sputum purulence, especially purulence, then, then antibiotics should be used. The types of antibiotics, there, there are many. We can use the penicillins with the clavulonic acid, like Augmentin, macrolides commonly used, tetracyclines for non-hospitalized patients, and as I said, culture only if no response. These quinolones as well. So, um, uh, so what I've tried to do today is kind of giving you maybe what the title says, some, some trends. Some of the things that we aren't using now, you're not going to be tested on now, but I think are just around the corner and I think to me it are, are pretty exciting. Um, and in fact, I rely a lot, I, I'm starting to use CT scanning and these folks that you send to me who have this chronic cough that won't go away and COPDs in the differential, the, the PFTs are not really that impressive. Uh, I'm, I'm sort of doing that um, kind of out of the... I don't know, out of practice or whatever, but, I, but I'm pretty excited about that and more to follow on that. So stay tuned for the COPD gene, uh, more coming up from the COPD gene study. Um, uh, the, the new dimension in, in looking at the clinical severity, instead of looking at just the spirometric values like the previous gold criteria, we're now looking at that block diagram of uh, spirometric data, symptoms, and numbers of exacerbations. So those three domains are really what we're having to consider now. Okay, just remember that. Uh, COPD in never smokers is poorly studied. It really should be. It's probably a different pathophysiological animal than the one in, in, in smokers, and then that needs to be done. I don't know if the, if the pharmaceutical companies find that there's enough population here for them to make a buck on it. I, I don't know what it is, but hopefully with more and more recognition we'll study that a little bit better. Um, the therapeutic regimen that I showed you is still, I think, very similar to the 2007 criteria, but it's guided by the new paradigm as I showed you. And then uh, for acute exacerbations, really what we want to do is predict and prevent uh, if we can. All right, I'm done and happy to take any questions. Uh, up there. Well, pulmonary rehabilitation clearly works, and, and people have asked a lot of questions about, well, do you have to be very sick? Uh, what if you're a continuing smoker? Does pulmonary rehabilitation help? And the answer to that, those questions and many others is, is definitely yes. The problem with pulmonary rehabilitation is that it's very labor intensive. I mean, almost every patient with COPD from moderate to severe could benefit and, and, would, and will benefit from, from pulmonary rehab even if they continue to smoke. Uh, the difficulty is just getting them to that is getting into pulmonary rehabilitation. It's very difficult. Um, there are a lot of regulations. You have to have a certain amount of space, so many square feet per, per patient. Um, the, the, the person who's the, the, uh, the coordinator, they can only do like six people at a time. You know, and you gotta pay a full-time coordinator. So if you wanna do masses of people, you have to have a lot of coordinators. So it's mainly the logistical problems with getting pulmonary rehab done. But clearly, it, it, it diminishes dyspnea. It increases the walk distance. Um, uh, and it's not only that, but we teach people how to, how to be more mechanically efficient, you know. So instead of putting your pots and pans down here where you have to lean forward for them, put them up here. Instead of putting things up here where you have to work above the level of the heart, you know, of the venous return, which is very difficult, put, you know, and moving furniture, it's very simple things that, that they learn. So there's a lot of education as well as the uh, endurance type of training that's very beneficial in pulmonary rehab. It's clearly been demonstrated. It does not improve survival but it does improve quality of life and decrease hospitalizations and loss of time at work. So it decreases loss of time at work. Yeah. Right. 
Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, there are, and in, in, uh, uh, I ran a rehab program at the VA in Atlanta, and, and one of my research coordinators now used to run a program here in Louisville, and she has material that she would give the patients once they finished the program, once they graduated. So once you graduate, you can give them instructions on how they can continue some of these endurance exercises. If, if they take the course, if, they take a, if, they, if you do pulmonary rehab, usually they're three days a week. Optimal is three days a week for about 18 to 24 sessions, and if they don't follow that, when they when they when they finish with the course, then a year later they'll be back to square one. So it's important that they maintain in some kind of endurance activity, and we can teach them that. There really aren't any good studies showing that we can. Okay, here, do this, do this, do this, and you know, uh, uh, at home there really aren't very good studies to, to demonstrate that that home-based, you know, literature or education to do this will, will has any benefit. No one has done that. Yeah. Well, that well, you have to COPD is really the qualifier, and and you have to have uh, different third-party payers use different things. But the F the, the FEV1 has to be, I think, below 50 percent. There are some numer- some numbers, some PFT numbers that they use to to pay for for paying payment purposes. It's really terrible because we we don't have good data on people like with idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis or other pulmonary diseases. But the data is coming out, and, and P- pulmonary rehab is helpful in those situations, but the companies, the insurers, the third-party payers aren't paying for them because they have no, no, um, you know, no data, they have no cut points, they have nothing to say, okay, we'll pay for this one, not for that one. It's very difficult to get, get it reimbursed. The other question I had was about your character, the kind of characteristics, the new, the new, uh, newly adopted characteristics of COP or the, um, right. and, and how we, how we kind of think about severity of disease. Um, is a community primary care doctor for many years, I had this very simple strategy, I went to office based if somebody had COPD, I'd put them on Spiriva. Mm-hmm. If they didn't feel quite well enough, I'd stick them on Advil or something like right, that. Right, right. I mean, so ju- justify, justify the fancy approach. Like why, why doesn't it work just to put people on inhalers and sedatives and simple Right. Well, well for, uh, I can tell you that some of my patients, you know, say, I can't pay $240 for Spiriva a month. So a lot of it is, is the, the, cost, the, the, the cost issue. So if someone is in a very mild category, you know, and they just get them to quit smoking and you know, take care of their comorbidities and give them a very cheap albuterol inhaler. Um, certainly, if, if they're moderate, bordering severe or severe, then you can really justify these more expensive and higher end um, long acting preparations. Um, I, I think if you have someone who's got mild, very mild disease and you just, you just aren't cutting it and their symptoms seem out of range, you know, send them to us. There might be something else going on. I mean, they might have pulmonary hypertension from. You know that we see older people, and, and they might have chronic thromboembolic disease. So there may be some other underlying problem that's causing their symptoms, and not just and not just the COPD. Yeah. So th- th- this is the paradigm. I you know I mean that's just that's that's out there. That's what Gold says. So you know if your FEV1 is per- percent predicted as 80, and the and the question says I put them on an inhaled corticosteroid, and you check that one, you're going to be wrong. <laughs> you're going to be wrong on the boards. Yeah. The, 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 probably the true answer is that we don't know, but, but the recommendation is to use it as needed, to use it as needed. You know, no one, few people I think feel that, that the, the drugs that don't modify the disease pathophysiology are probably not going to change the progression. And in fact, even in these studies using the combination therapies, when you look at the decline in FEV1 over time, it really doesn't change that slope. What you do is, you know, here, here's the placebo, like, that you start out together, the placebo the, 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 what the drug does, it puts you like this, and then it very early in the, in the study, and then you start doing like this, and then you parallel down. So your FEV1 at any given time point is better than placebo, but the decline remains the same. Even with corticosteroids, you just say, gee, you would think that corticosteroids would change that slope, but they don't. They don't change that slope. So, I mean, these drugs work. They make people feel better. They, they, they improve their baseline, but the, but the natural history, the, the disease progression, we really can't stop it. The only way to stop it is to stop smoking. And the only way to make them live longer if they qualify as supplemental oxygen. We're still, we're still there. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you.